I can start that. <coughs> John 12. We're going to read just a couple verses and we're going to pray. And uh, I'll be seated. I know I ain't got a lot of time, but uh, if you want to preach this today, just as a reminder to us. So, John 12, verse number 20. You're there, say amen. Amen. You're not there, say help me. All right, keep going. All right, I'll wait for you. All right, John 12. I'm going to that Bible. Verse 20 says, and there came, and, and there were certain Greeks among them that came to worship at the feast, and the same came before, therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida, and Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh, and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew, and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them and said, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say to you, except the quarter of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. And if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, thank you for your holy and precious word, and as we uh, dive into it in a few minutes we have tonight, thank you for the fun and the games and celebrating a little bit of Christmas, giving some gifts out. God, I don't want to ever forget the, the precious gift of Jesus, the cross of Calvary, the blood that was shed for you and for me as we come to Christmas time. God, the number one, if someone's in here that's not truly saved, I pray that you'd speak to them. I can't do that. You have to do it. So I pray you to do that tonight. And then for us Christians, just a little reminder of uh, just the shadow that was over the manger. And as we celebrate this, God, it was for an end, and it was for an hour. And so I pray that you just prick our hearts tonight. I pray if we're not right with you, get right with you. Pray, God, if there's something that um, you just need to do in us tonight, I pray that you'd have liberty to do that, regardless of what's on a pen and paper on my, on my uh, tablet here. I just pray you do work in our hearts tonight. And thank you, God. I thank you for a great year at uh, you, this youth group, people being saved and soul winners being <coughs> added, and I just thank you. So meet with us now. We need you to do that. In Jesus' holy and awesome name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can see it. Every year I do a little lesson around Christmas time and uh, the festivities and everything that goes on with Christmas. Uh, I'm that guy who's not festive at all. You know, I wear uh, uh, Christmas stuff at Easter and Easter stuff at Christmas. I'm just not a festive guy. So... When I first, we first started the youth group, I wanted a reminder every Christmas, and I called it the shadow over the manger, and I did the same thing every year, and this year, God just kind of led me a different direction, not that we won't cover some of that, but I just want to see a little intro to this, as we're looking at our passage, I want you to see uh, something that uh, Jesus is saying before we get to this shadow that's over the manger, and if you've been in church very long, you know uh, what's over top of it and what, what shattered the manger from the very beginning, but I just it's a, it's a reminder service. And so here's what I want you to get. The intro, I want you to see his coming. Jesus talks uh, right here, number one, about his coming. You go back to, to verse number, uh, well, I don't have it written down, but I think it's verse number 23. Uh, he said, the hour is, no, 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 verse 27, I'm sorry, verse 27. He said, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause, where you watch what he says, came I unto this hour. You see, there was a coming of Jesus, and Christmas is important. Without Christmas, there was no cross. Without Christmas, there was no sacrifice. And so we, we, we've been going over in Sunday school the past couple weeks just the significance of the virgin birth and who was God. He was a virgin born. He was God in the flesh. All that was important, and that is important for us to understand and know and to have some sort of, I wouldn't say celebration, but hey, catch it now. Some uh, recollection of Christmas. Yes, it had to happen. God had to become, be born of a woman and become a man so that he could live on this earth a perfect life and then eventually die. He had to have human blood. So there was a coming of Jesus. But number two, I want you to see his cause. Because in verse number 27, he said, uh, but for this cause came I into the world. Or for this cause came I into this hour. There was a cause. Not, not one that he made up. Listen, not one that Jesus made up on the spot. No, no, no. There was a cause that Jesus always had. Revelation, I can't remember where it said, said that 
Jesus or the Lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. So if we look at the beginning of all things before the world was, listen to me, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost, they knew that Jesus would have to be born and have to die before any of this ever came to pass. So this cause was not something that they just made up on a whim and said, you know, it would be pretty cool if Jesus died on a cross. That would be awesome. No, it was already thought up in the mind of God before you and I ever came into existence, before the world that we stand in and even became into existence, God had a cause. He says, for this cause, he had a specific plan that was laid out. And watch this. He was determined to carry out that plan. I want you to take your Bible and hold right here. We're going to John 18 really quickly and verse number 11. He was determined to carry out this plan. This was a cause that he could not let go. You see, his coming was important, but the cause of his coming, I believe, was more important. Hey, listen to me. There, had, there was a cause that Jesus had that he could not let go, and he was determined to finish that, regardless of what happened. And so look at chapter 18, verse number 11. Verse number 11, Then Jesus said unto Peter, He says, Put up thy sword. Now, if you don't know the story, Peter took out a sword, and he cut off a dude's ear. He wasn't a very good shot. Supposed to cut the head off, and he missed, and he got the ear right. And he said... Peter did this, but watch what he says. He was determined. This is how determined Jesus was. Put up thy sword in, into thy sheath, the cup, watch, which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? You see, Jesus knew because he was God what was about to happen, and he was so determined that even though he knew the outcome from which he was, he was about to partake, the thing he was about to partake in, the shadow that overshadowed the manger, he was determined to go to it regardless. In the book of Matthew, I think it says, he turns to him and says, Could I not call 12 legions of angels and they would come and rescue me? I always like to think of this, that at any time Jesus could have thought the command. Listen, he could have thought the command. He didn't need to wave his hand. He didn't need to say anything. Jesus, as a person, could have thought the command and the whole world would have been destroyed and he would have been left in space by himself with us all gone. He could have done it in an instant, but he had a cause. And his cause, he was determined to go to the cross. In chapter 12, verse 27, back in our text, it says, why, why, the, the, my father, go back and look at it real quick, because I'm going to stumble over it until I read it again. Verse 27 says, uh, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He, 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 he's like, why would my father save me from the hour from which I was born to be in? It's the very cause from which Jesus said, why, why would I say, Father, save me from this hour? It's why I came. And so Matthew 26, verse 42, he says, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. See, his determination to do, to do God's will. Hey, this is good. Listen to me, teenager. His determination to do God's will was beyond human fulfillment. His determination, I'm going to say it one more time because some of you ain't got it yet. His determination to do God's will was beyond human fulfillment. There is a person in here that if they knew the suffering of the cross would say, I would willingly go to that because that's what God said. No, 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 we're going to fight tooth and nail. But Jesus, beyond human fulfillment, said, I will go because my Father hath sent me. That is my cause. My mind went back to 1 Samuel 17, 29, where David went to the battlefield, and he said, oh, he went to his brothers, and Goliath was yelling and cursing the armies of Israel. And no one was doing anything. And David went and said, what is going on? Why is this happening? And his brothers got mad at him and said, why are you here? And, and he looked at him and he said, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason that someone should do something to this uncircumcised Philistine? And so this, this is... This thought came to my mind. If Jesus was so willing, and David was so willing, maybe some of us need to be so willing that there is a cause to live righteously. There's a cause to just be good. To say, I will be obedient, regardless of what anyone else thinks. Uh, I, I told this to, uh, I can't remember, oh, I was, I was talking to uh, uh, some of my kids, and, and they were talking about uh, movies, and we were watching this movie, as, as like it was, it, the acting wasn't the best, and but it was a good movie. It was clean. Uh, they had, there was no cussing. There was no um, nudity. There wasn't any of that. So it was just a clean movie. We watched it. It was pretty cool. It was a pretty good movie. But the, the acting was, you know, it wasn't. I said this. Now listen to me. I said this. 
Y'all better get used to that stuff because if you're going to watch Hollywood stuff, they're going to fill it with, with the homosexual agenda. They're going to fill it with trans, transgender agenda. And all, they're going to try to fill you. If you're wanting up the A grade, they're going to fill your mind with it. And there's got to be a cause in your heart. There'll be a day. Listen, you mark my words if Jesus comes back. There'll be a day. The only reason you get married is not because there's going to be anything with the government. You get married to a person the, of the opposite sex, come on now, uh -huh. it, 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 you get married to them not because it's going to legalize anything with the government, they're going to outlaw it. Instead, you're going to do it because it's right with God. There's going to be a day where you can go out and you can buy the drugs and take them legally in our country. Listen to me now, it's going to get worse, worse and worse. And the only reason that you and I won't do it is because there's a cause beyond human fulfillment to fulfill the cause of God in our life. David got it, Jesus got it. There's a cause. You see, he came, but there's a cause why he came. And you didn't forget that. I think sometimes Christian uh, ladies and gentlemen in this world forget we're here for a cause. And it's not to get a job and fill, feed the flesh and do all. We have a cause directly from Almighty God. It's, it's to you and to me. There's a cause. Number three, look at the confidence. Verse 23 of our text. Look at it. John 12, look for 23. It says this, and Jesus answered them, saying, The hours come that the Son of Man should be, what's that word right there? Glorified. The confidence that Jesus had was, he knew what was going to happen, but he knew that in the end, so there was going to be some glory given to God somehow. So he had confidence in the plan of God. That the coming, but he knew the cause was right. He said, you know, I may go through a lot of stuff, but in the end, oh my goodness, I don't. Turn back, and we'll take you to two places very quickly. How much time I got? Okay, go back. Go back to Luke chapter twenty-four. <laughs> this, 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 this verse just popped in my head. I got to show it to you. Luke chapter twenty-four. Ver Luke chapter twenty-four. Just a couple pages back. I'm going to show you this. I don't even have this written down on my on my paper. So you have to write, write this verse down so you look at it later. Because watch this. If we look outwardly. And why we should follow God. Why we should do the things that God says that are right and good. Outwardly to our friends, to our schools, maybe even your parents. That might not be something that is desirable. You might lose friends. You might not be welcome in the in crowd or because you are doing things according to God's will. But what we have to have is a confidence that in the end of it all, as Jesus did, God will be glorified through it. Now Paul said it like this. And I don't know if any of us want to actually say this. He said, I'm ready to be offered. I didn't say offered. But he said, I, I, my, um, God will be glorified whether by my life or by my death. Paul said, if it takes me dying for God to get glory, I'm willing to do that. Ouch. But he said, if I want to live, it's going to glorify God. But if I die, I'm going to do it glorifying God. And it's a watch. I'm getting distracted. Chapter 24, look at verse number 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Luke 24, verse 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his, what? Glory. You see, it took suffering of Jesus for him to enter into glory, it says. And in them verses in our text, it says, uh, the, the, the Son of Man, I'm going to go through this hour that I might be glorified. Go to 1 Peter now. Hold, uh, you got hold John 12. You got to hold it there because we got to flip back quickly. I got to show you these verses. 1 Peter chapter number three. 1 Peter chapter number three. If you're just if you're just following along, pay attention very carefully. Listen to this. 1 Peter chapter number three, verses fifteen and sixteen. I'm going to show you a couple things. The glorification, the confidence that Jesus had that once he got here. There was a cause, and he said, I'm going to fulfill that cause, because in the end, there's going to be glory given to God because of that. And I don't know what God's doing in your heart. I don't know the things that he may be doing in your life, but there may be some things. Listen to me. Listen to me. There may be some things that God asks you to do or tells you to do or says you ought not to do, and you say, but I really want to do it, or I really don't want to do it. And it's something that just it just weighs on your heart and weighs on your or, on, on your very being. You say, I don't, I don't want to do that. That's not something I desire to do. Do you have enough confidence to know that there's a cause? Listen, that there is a cause that God gives you directly. And you say, God, I don't know why you're going to do it. I don't know how you're going to do it. I'm not going to like it while I'm going through it. But I'm going to do it because in the end I trust and have a confidence that you will be glorified through it. It might not feel good. I know this. 
God never promised us a, a prosperous life. I mean, the, one of the, all, the some of the most spiritual people in the Bible are martyred or killed for Jesus' sake. And so, look at 1 Peter chapter number 3, look at verse 15. It says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that is in, within you with meekness and fear. Can't preach that verse? Love to, but I can't. Look at verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as, evil, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your conversation in Christ. He said there's going to be a time, and it may be 2022, where you're trying to do good for Jesus, and it says, they look at you and they say, you're doing evil for Jesus. That, or evil in the world. That you're doing all these Christian things, and these Christian things are hate speech, and oh, you, you, you Christian, all these things. And, and, and he says, but in the end, they don't have anything to say. They can't, they can't bring you to the law. They can't say that you're doing anything wrong. They just hate what you're saying and hate your message, because it's right in line with Scripture. Look at chapter 4, look at chapter 4, verse 13. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. He's talking about a fiery trial in your life. When that, when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. It says that these things that, that may happen in your life that aren't very fun, that you have to say no to and everyone else is saying yes to, that you have to just trust the plan of God, trust the cause of God, say, God, you've got this. Have a confidence that in the end you'll be glorified. Peter says this, the end, if you just keep going, hey, listen, in the end, if you just keep going, you'll also be exceeding black and have joy. So it ain't like it's just like, this is horrible, 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 but God's going to be glorified. And in the end, there's going to be some true joy given to you, and there's got to be confidence. Jesus had that confidence. Jesus had that confidence. Let's go back to our text, John 12. So what's the shadow? We all know what the shadow is. If you've been in the church very long, this hour, what is this hour in verse 23 and verse 27? What point has he come to? Verse 27 says, others will look and wonder why he's not being saved from it. What? Watch. Verse number 12. Look at chapter 12, verse 27. You all got your Bibles out still? Look at 27. It says, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He's like, there's going to be people that, when I go through this, are going to say, why aren't people saving you from this? Why is it the, should I tell him to save me from this? It's why I came. So, he himself was troubled. Do you see that in verse 27? He said, now is my soul with me. <coughs> now I, I sneeze about that every time. And every, every time. He says, his soul was troubled. Now watch it, look at what it says. He said, but... But the very reason he came was for this, and it's the cross. You all know what it is. You all seen the manger scenes with the cross and the shadow over over the over it. And so it casts us from the very moment he was born, it cast a shadow over him. The manger to, to Christmas. The cross was why he came. And I know we can sing about silent night, holy night, but I like what the kids said. It's not so silent night, man. It wasn't. I think it was such a silent night. And we can hear all this and get all warm and fuzzy inside. But in the end, guys, just picture this. You have a little baby. And I don't know, Mary, how much Mary knew. I don't know. But to think in Father, the fa God the Father's eyes, as soon as that little precious baby, because babies are precious to God, Amen. was born, he knew that he was going to just born. And, and i never forget this either, that he grew the tree that he knew would be made to... The old rugged cross. Do you know God grew the tree that would be cut out for the cross that his son would die? I would curse the tree. But he knew it. That's why he was there. So what did the shadow bring? What the shadow brought? Number one, this is what the shadow brought. It brought crucifixion. It brought crucifixion. Look at verse 24 of our text. I've seen it in these verses. Look at our text. Verse 24. This is what Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and, what? Die. Listen to me, guys. Listen to me. The cross has no power unless there is a, someone crucified on it. Hey, this has no power if Jesus didn't die on it. Do you understand that? It would just be like an electric, us looking at an electric chair. Maybe you come in next week and I got a pulpit made out of an electric chair. 
be like, what in the world you got that? That's an instrument of death. That's hanging out around her neck. Do you know why this has power? Because our Savior's hands were nailed to it in his feet. That's why it has power. You see, the, it brought the crucifixion of Jesus. That's why. But watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, the, the, the preaching of the cross, listen, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. So what I do is when I preach the cross, when I talk about the cross, when I talk about the blood, when I talk about Jesus being crucified on it, what I can almost do is go through the crowd and wonder who's saved and not saved. Because those that are not saved, they say it's foolishness to them. They don't want to hear about it. It doesn't affect their heart. It doesn't move them at all to know that someone who is very innocent, someone who had no sin, died in, in a horrific, horrible way and was nailed to a cross for you and for me, and it doesn't affect them at all. That if I wouldn't have sinned, he wouldn't have had to die. It says, to those who are saved, it is the power of God. The power comes because someone died on it. A, the crucifixion brought death. Obviously. The, cruise, the cross had a 100% fatality rate. The Bible calls this, this too, along with his death, he calls things like scourging. Matthew 27, 26, Mark 15, 15, and Luke 18, 33 says they scourged him. And I don't know, you can go look it up. Uh, I usually go into more detail with this. I just don't have time and I wasn't planning on it anyway. But listen, a scourging is when they would strip the, the person down. I've heard some people say they're stripping down completely naked. Some just bare their back. But I know this, the Bible says that from the heel of his foot and to the top of his head, there was no soundness, but, but sores. So from the top of Jesus' head to the bottom of his feet, they, they beat him. And it said that they would take these, these whips that would, uh, 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 I never get this image out of my hand, where they would take ribbons of skin and pull them away. They say that, that Jesus was beat so bad they would beat these, these men so bad that you would see their ribs because of the flesh that they removed. Are you talking about the scourging? Yeah, if you were scourging. Yeah, yeah. Scourging. And so watch this. There was a scourging, but not only that, there was a mocking. I don't know what would be worse to watch God. If, if, if I was a God to watch my son getting beat, that would be bad. But then to watch him after they were beat to mocking. And set him up and put a robe on him and say, oh, hail king of the Jews. And they would beat him and slap him and say, oh, you're the king. Oh, and they'd laugh, mocking him. I hate mocking. My kids, they start mocking me or mocking one of my kids. I said, that's not happening. My I just got mocked when I was a kid. I won't go there, man. I, oh, that would burn me up. They were mocking him. But also came with death, they, they crucified him. Now, if you know this or not, but they used to take the nails and they would drive them through the hands on both sides through the holes or into the wood and then in the feet and a person wouldn't die because of that but if you picture Jesus already been beat to an inch of his life and his back is already his ribs are probably showing you ever rub a piece of um, wood on an open wound before but could you imagine the only way Jesus could get a breath from not dying was because they would nail their feet and the only way that they, because they would die because they couldn't raise up to exhale. That's how you die. Because you can't exhale when you're armed and you've got pressure on the diaphragm. And so the only way you could breathe is to take the feet that were nailed and press against them, the nails, and then raise up. But while he's doing that, his back's rubbing up that cross. It's already been opened. See, crucifixion, it just says crucified. That's why I like to say it's a shadow over the manger because we read through it, and then it just says crucified, and then we read, and then we go on. But what he had to endure, because you messed up and I messed up, and he was perfect, he didn't deserve it, there was death, there was distress. B, there was distress in the crucifixion. John, 24, John 12, our text, look at verse 24. He says, Verily, verily, I say to you, except the corn of wheat... Fall into the ground and die, it abideth, and what's that word said? Alone. Now, Jesus was trying to trouble him. Uh, John 16.34 said, or, yeah, no, no, no. John 16.32 says this. 
you all are going to leave me. And I'm just paraphrasing. Listen to me, guys. Listen to me. He said, you all are going to leave me. And I'm going to be alone. He said, but I'm not alone. Because the Father's with me. And if, if you're saved, truly saved, okay, you're ne you will never, listen, you'll never be alone. Amen. Ever. But this is what got me. And I know I've preached on this crucifixion. And I know, man, that, that this that pains my heart to hear of my Savior doing that stuff. But here's what I think gets me more than anything. He said, I'm never alone because my Father's with me. But yet in Matthew 27, 46, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, never before, guys, you listening? Never before had the Godhead been separated in eternity. But for you and for me, Jesus had to be alone. See, Luke 22, verse 44 says he, he sweat as it were great drops of blood to the ground. He was such in such distress over what he was about to go over and people or go through. And people say this. He saw the cross and he didn't go to the cross. I don't think he minded pain. I don't think he said that, man, I'm, 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 I'm sweating great drops of blood because there's going to be so much pain to this thing. I think this, Jesus knew that from eternity he'd never been separated from the Father. But because he looked down on earth and he said, hey, there's a bunch of sinful people that need redeemed from their sin. I will be separated from the Father. And it's never happened to me before. It's never happened to me before. The God in heaven, who's sovereign in all he does, I've never been separated from the Father. But because I love this world so much, I'll separate from him to take on their sin. And I think that's what will cause distress in him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And if you wouldn't have messed up, he wouldn't have done it. If I hadn't messed up, he wouldn't have done it. It was the shadow that was over the cross. It brought distress, but watch this. It brought a direct result. See? It brought a direct result. Look at these verses. It says this, except the corn of wheat, verse 24, fall into the ground and die, and abideth alone. But watch, but if it die, it bringeth forth what? Much more. Now, I want you guys to understand this. Listen to me. I'm not talking about work salvation. I'm not talking about work salvation, but listen to me. It doesn't say that you might or maybe will bring forth fruit. Jesus said, if I go, and he's talking about himself, if I go as a wheat and I go into the ground and I die, there's going to be some fruit come out of me. That's where the way seeds work. And he's saying this, that when I go to the cross and I die for humanity, when you get a hold of me, there's going to be fruit come out of you. He said, it's not mine or maybe. And he it said, it's, not, it's going to bring it forth fruit. It's not going to be hidden. You, there is no such thing as hidden Christianity, especially in 2022. You're not going to be a hidden Christian. You're going to be a hypocrite. And it says it will bring much fruit. The, the Bible speaks of this. I don't have time to preach all this. 30, 60, and 100 fold. Every fold. Hey, guys, listen to me. Every Christian, truly born again Christian in this room, you will bring forth fruit. It might be 30, it might be 60, it might be 100. Listen to me. But you're going to bring forth fruit. Ask yourself, teenager, what fruit have you brought for Jesus lately? What has it been? 30, 60, 100? Because Jesus said there's going to be something. Y'all see that? And he goes to the ground and dies. If a seed goes into the ground and dies, it doesn't just stay dead. There's something that comes out of it. So ask yourself, what fruit? Well, I ain't got no fruit. What kind of fruit you got? Works in the flesh? You may want to think if you really took this Jesus thing seriously. Because if all that you're bringing out of your life is works of the flesh, listen to me, you still might be the flesh. Regeneration is regeneration. Y'all hear me? And so Matthew 7, 16, works don't save you, but prove you're saved. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may... Oh, no. Matthew... When did they start doing that? Matthew 7, 16... It says this. Ready? You shall know them by their fruits. And so, what do people know you by? See, that's what crucifixion brought. A direct, it's a, it's a direct result 
of knowing Christ. Number two, write this down. There's a choice. John 12, 25 says this. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it. And so here's what you guys got to determine. The shadow of the cross caused Jesus to do all this. I, I'm not going to be able to preach it, everything tonight. And we'll give you the points that we've done. You're either going to have to love your life or you're going to have to hate it. Is that not what Jesus just said right there? You're either going to have to love your life or you're going to have to hate it. Not as a hating your life as a, an anger or disdain for it, but in comparison, your want to live for Jesus, it looks, it appears like you hate the way you want to live compared to the way he, compares to the way that you were living for him. Romans chapter 12, verse... I mean, I can't do that. Yeah, again, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a what? And here's what people do. I heard this this week, and it just stuck to me. Here's what people say. I die for Jesus. But listen to me, guys. That's not what he asks us to do. He asks us to live for him. And that's a lot harder. You know what he tells you to die to? To you. You have to die to you. And that's hating your life so that his life, you have to choose. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says choose life. No last one, number three, you have, there's a cross. There's a cross. John 12, 26, he says this. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, he says these words, serve and follow Living for Christ never promises you and me fame and fortune. Actually, he says this. Guys, listen. I've got to be done. He says, marvel not when the world hates you. If it hated me, Jesus said, it's going to hate you. There's a cross that you're going to have to take up. The three enemies we have, the devil, the world, and the flesh, all operate, listen, on the flesh surviving. Again, I don't have time to go into this, but just catch this. They all work on the flesh has to survive. And you chasing after those things. You're not getting this. Some of y'all lost you already. You chasing after fleshly things will please him. Instead, he says, a cross is what you need to take up. Die to self. Pick up your cross. See, I'm not saying yes to myself. I'm saying I'm going to pick up the cross that I'm supposed to bear. And this is what Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Isn't that what it says? And so tonight, the shadow over the manger is just a reminder, but listen to me. It's a reminder for you and me to say no to us and yes to him. What fruit have you had for Jesus? Ask yourself that. And maybe we could have an altar call. Say, God, I need you. I want my life again. Every head bowed, every